Yes. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another teacher talk session uh, tonight. And this is 29th sessions of teacher talks. And I'm really happy that it's going, you know, uh, it's going really great. So far, so good. And tonight I have a really uh, another special guest. Uh, most of you maybe know her. She is a very popular teacher trainer and also English teacher. And also uh, she's an educational coordinator at Dalton College in Izmir. And her name is Sara Liz Mani. And she's here. And I don't want to waste time to talk to her. And I would like to invite her to join the session. Yes. Yes, there she is. Hello, Sarah. It's great to see you. Great. Welcome to Teacher Talks live section. Thank you. It's great to see you. And how are you? You look great. great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your nice introduction as well. <laughs> I hope I didn't make a mistake about it. <laughs> it was okay. Okay, great, great. And before I start the like our conversation, I would like to say thank you to join my uh, teacher talks live sessions. It really made me happy to accept my invitation and join here and sharing your times and ideas and experiences with us, Sarah. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to join as well. Okay, great, and. Uh, if you are ready, we can start and the audiences, they can come slowly to join us and they can listen to us and we can start if you're ready. Course, can we? Of course, of course yeah. <laughs> okay, so can you can you tell us about yourself, please, Sarah? Of course. So, uh, as you introduced me, actually. So, firstly, I've been teaching since 2009, actually, in Turkey, but mm -hmm. originally, um, I come from England. I studied in England and graduated with business management degree. Later on, I came into teaching. And oh, great. It's always been that way. I haven't stopped. Wow, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's great. So, uh, can you also tell us about uh, tell us about your experiences in teaching? Of course. So, back in two thousand nine, I'll be honest. I started with absolutely no idea about anything. I started in a language <laughs> school, first of all, and, and I had no idea of the Turkish curriculum. I had no idea of students' level of English or their lack of English, actually. At the time, the phrase was, yeah, I can understand, but I can't talk. This was what mm -hmm. they would say at the time. Um, and after that, I soon went into <sighs> private schools and started teaching there. And in 2012, I realized one of the biggest um, missing factors of English teaching was phonics, actually. So in 2012, I became a phonics teacher trainer. And that was mm -hmm. one of the most important parts wow. of my teaching career. Uh -huh. Especially for the younger students, they need to learn how to read, read correctly. Because it's something that I really saw in the older students. They didn't have this foundation. So that was one mm -hmm. of the turning points in my teaching career actually and since then I've, yeah, I've kept on teaching in private school and like you said just in the last couple of years I'm still teaching but I'm also working as an educational coordinator as well. Oh, great, great. It's a very, it's a very great experience about teaching Sarah <laughs> and I would like to <laughs> before I would like to change the order of my questions. Like, in when we, and you, when we came to that point, like, can you also tell us about your current, uh, not the business, but the school and what kind of things you are doing there, if it's okay? Of course, yeah. So um, I've been working at Dalton College for the last three years now. And the school in itself has a really different idea about teaching and learning. For example, we don't use a traditional teaching method. We use the Dalton education model, which is really mm -hmm. more student-based learning. Uh, and it's great to see that implemented because although it's something that, uh, in, in theory, I wasn't taught through the Dalton 
an education model, but it is the way that people teach and the way that you learn in England. It's how I grew up, actually. Learning more responsibility mm -hmm. to uh, learn for yourself, actually, not relying just on the teacher. So it's great to be in this environment and implement in this kind of education to students. To students, I see. Is, is Dalton College is only in Izmir or it has a different, you know, schools around Turkey? No, it's our first uh, school in Turkey. We're the only Dalton school in Turkey at the minute. Uh -huh. It's been a process, though. It's taken us two years to become a member of Dalton International. At the mm. uh -huh. um, okay. It's a hard process, but hopefully in the future there will be more Dalton schools. Turkey as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. It's great. It's great. Okay, so uh, I hope it will, and we also lots of the students will have a chance to get that kind of education from you and from Dalton College. And so my other question is about your yeah, it's, it's about your uh, your favorite moment or experience in your own education. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite moment or experience in your own education when you think about it? Maybe not, I, can, I can't say my favorite, but the one part of my education that really actually changed my whole education was my chemistry lessons in high school. And that was the, wow. first, yeah, that was the first time uh, I really learned how to learn. Uh, the teacher was amazing in the way that he taught us how to be organized, how to prepare for exams, how to prepare for lessons. That was a real turning point for me. And in some way, I'm lucky that I found that. Mm -hmm. But in another way, I feel it took me until high school to find a teacher like that, actually. Oh, it's great. You still remember it. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great, great teacher. Thanks to him or her. I, I, do you remember his or her name? Yeah, he's uh, not a nice name, actually, in English. Dr. Grime. Ah, I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I got it. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my <clears throat> my other question is, is is like this: you know, when when the lockdown, you know, the started, and you know, the teachers, you know, they were told to do online teaching, and uh, lots of of really became stressful about that one because this situations suddenly happened, and they said, okay, now we are moving to online, and you know, we are probably more relaxed and organized while teaching uh, online now. But I think they were, uh, you know, two groups in this period, in this pandemic period, like the ones who simply, you know, the lecture and move to the, as they believed. This was a temporary situation and it will end soon. And so the other, th other parts, they tried millions of digital tools to engage students in, in their online classes. So in your point, like, do you have any suggestions about, the usage of digital tools, Sarah? Yeah, first I'd like to say that I can understand both teaching sides here. We have the more traditional teachers that I'm sure would have panic mode and um, mm -hmm. didn't really know what to do and just try to act like this was a stage. You know, this is a phase, we're going to go through this. Four weeks, six weeks, two months and it will finish. I can understand those kind of teachers. I didn't really want to accept the changes, actually. Um, and then I can see the other side, the other teachers that went technology crazy mm -hmm. and quite possibly introduced every form of uh, technology possible while doing an online lesson. And I think it's important, actually, to find the middle way. I don't think either of them are right. Uh, we can never go back to how teaching was. And I really believe that now teaching's changed forever and the way that we teach has changed the way that students learn has changed. But I think there has to be a boundary on technology at the same time. I don't think technology is the right way to teach, but at the minute, it's all that we have. Um, so it's kind of knowing when to stop, when to you know, get students to pick up a book and read, for mm -hmm. not just for academic. And when it's the time for them to pick up a pencil and paper, because we have realize the way that students learn is different. Some people need to write things visually. Exactly. Uh -huh. okay. um, you know, instead of just doing all constant live lessons, having the chance for students to repeat the lessons through a video, you know, lots of students need the repetition as well. So I think it's knowing when to 
you know, get rid of technology and when to use technology. And that's through experience. We're all doing this for the first time. I don't think there's a right answer. I think it's knowing your students, knowing your class, and knowing when to stop and when to continue with technology. I see. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> And it's it's really hard to actually these days, but I hope it will end soon and we will back to the face to face education again. And so this 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 part this one is really you know uh, interesting one about and the hard one you know the about our workload you know as you know that right now we have a really huge workload you know our duty is you know to take more time in distance education you know than it takes in face to face classes and also in addition to this like parents are more involved in this process now especially this online teaching and what would you suggest to i mean us to maintain our well-being and also do you have any suggestions sorry uh any in terms of balancing our workload uh, yeah that's a really good question and there's two <laughs> I can yeah. see the teacher's side and the teacher's point of view, but I can also see as a, you know, as an educational coordinator, the other side and the needs that we have. Yeah. But um, I think it's balance and it's really difficult to get the balance right now. How can you get the balance? I think it's by making boundaries. Parents need to know when to stop um, because right now we could work 24 hours a day and it would never be enough for some parents. There's always somebody that wants their essay check-in. There's always somebody that mm -hmm. wants to check their students' answers. There's always a student that will write a message saying, yeah, I didn't understand, can you help? And I think it's really important to put those boundaries across. You have to for your own sake. Um, because, you know, work life has, isn't nine to five anymore. Even though teachers yes. never had that workload actually. Um, it's much harder. We have much more preparation. Uh, when the lesson finishes, you don't leave the lesson. Go to the teacher's room. You leave the lesson, check your phone. You know, seeing what teacher, what student didn't understand, what parent has a question. Um, so I think, like I said, boundaries. Parents need to know when to stop, and you also need to know when to stop. I can also understand this point. You want to do your best. You want to uh, mm -hmm. do more things for the students, keep them occupied, keep them motivated. Uh, but you have to put the boundaries into place as well. You have to know when to stop yourself, make time for yourself. And the only way you can really do this is through making your own routine. Like we've encouraged the students all along to uh -huh. routine. you know, wake up in the morning, have your breakfast, do your lessons, have break, eat lunch. And for the teachers, it's the same. Make yourself a routine. When you're going to Uh, have your live lessons, when you're going to record your videos, when you're going to check the students' homework, when you're going to stop answering your WhatsApp messages, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's not it's an ongoing, never-ending job, actually. So it's the boundaries that need to be put in place, for sure. I see. I see. Thank you. It's great. And especially, yeah, we are, we are trying, actually. We're trying to do our best, as you said. I mean, as a teacher also. But, you know, sometimes it's really hard or both sides, yeah. I think, to Try do it. To As it. you said, we need to balance it. You need to find the right balance. Mm -hmm. You're right. Try Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Uh, and this, my other question is like uh, about the course books. Like, I would like to start, like, you know, the, start like, like, you know, the most of the schools, I mean, addicted to the course books, you know, they cannot do, they, it looks they cannot do anything without course books, you know. Now, however, you know, uh, during the lockdown, most of the students, as you know, that student couldn't reach their course books as they had left them at schools in this current situation. You know, therefore, teachers, you know, had to find, you know, to, or create new materials or to teach to them, you know. And I think, you know, Uh, it was a great opportunity you know, for teachers to define the place of course books stood in our life in this period. Like, do you think the course books, you know, are essential component of, you know, our lessons? And also, what is their place in education? Okay, it's a really good question for me, actually. <laughs> Because I'm really against Thank you. Books, actually. I really think that teachers that just rely on that 
course books are doing something wrong, actually. Of course, we use them. There are guidelines, actually, but we should never base uh -huh. upon uh, course books. Um, because there isn't a perfect course book out there, actually. For one grade from kindergarten to high school, there isn't a perfect course book. There is, it's not perfect for the teacher and it's not perfect for the students in any way. So I think it's good and I think this is how it should be. Those course books should only be a guideline. Teachers should mm -hmm. be making their work. They should be implementing the lessons according to the students. Because the course books are made for one level, for one kind of student, for one learning type. Where in the reality, you have a class with different learners, different learning types yes. at different levels. You know, the class isn't all right. the same. So I think it's much better, and I think it's the right way to be used as a guide, and the teacher should be doing the work themselves. They should be making their own lessons, not the book. Not the book, I see. Thank you. It's a great, nice, nice answer about it, and it's a great answer. I'm also, you know, sometimes, you know, I have ideas about the course books, just like you. So it's, it's definitely, it's a guide, it's for us, not a, you know, definite tool to use. Oh. I should really use it. I cannot do anything without the course book. We should don't think like this. I mean, like, that's it. Just take it as a guide and do the rest. I see. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, the other thing is, you know, especially, you know, from the March, I think, when the first lockdown starts, you know, we had, you know, lots of chances to attend the webinars during this pandemic period. Like, but except the webinars, what can we do for our professional growth these days? Um, yeah, I think all webina webinars, seminars, conferences, they're great and we get really good ideas and we keep up to date with the new information, the new kinds of technology. We should be participating. But I think more importantly is actually just observing sometimes because what we learn in the webinars or the seminars, you can't always implement in class. It's not easy mm -hmm. to join a webinar on a Saturday and then go into the class on a Monday and implement things. You need more help. You need to observe and, you know, slowly implement things. So I guess for me, it's to continue with the uh, learning. You need to read more, read more about the implementation, not just the theory of things. Um, so I think, you know, you have to put things into reality a little bit more. See how you yes. can use it in your classroom, in your school, as a group of teachers, as a team. Uh, you should be more considering those kind of things, not just the information that you take from the seminars or webinars. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And <clears throat> my other uh, one is about, you know, uh, actually, you are an educational coordinator. Uh, I, so as an educational coordinator, so... What are the characteristics of effective language teacher for you? Oh, for language teacher, I think all yes. of us, um, you should definitely be in some way a little bit crazy. <laughs> I you see. Suffering when you're teaching languages, it's already really hard for students to learn in a second language. Most students uh -huh. find it difficult, they lack confidence. So I think having a teacher full of energy, And it's been a little bit crazy. I know I've seen some of your um, lessons. I've seen some of your tactics as well. You wear wigs, <laughs> wear hats, you're jumping around. And yeah. I think maybe I shouldn't share. <laughs> but this is the truth. No problem. It's great. No, no, no. You can't say. You know, I still have some things here. You see? <laughs> I still keep it there. So that's what I mean. You have to be, you know, uh, really full of energy, motivated. You have to believe in what you're doing and really enjoy what you're doing. But when uh -huh. teaching languages, one of the things that I've always been, in, uh, I've really believed in, actually, is speaking the language. I know it's easy mm -hmm. sometimes, and it's maybe easier to go into a class and speak the language. We should be speaking English uh, from any age, you know, from kindergarten, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, all the way up to high school. They need to hear the language. They need to adapt to the language. So I think a little bit of craziness and full uh, grossment of mm -hmm. the language is what to be doing. That's what makes you a good language teacher. I see. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks. Nice. Especially also giving some examples for me also. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. So my, <laughs> this, especially this one, I'm really wondering, you know, the answer of you, yours, yours. I mean, like what, uh, what do you suggest, you know, to, for, to the teachers to establish an effective rapport with the students online? You know, this one maybe was easy when we were in face-to-face -face education and now we are in online classes. So what do you suggest to us? Hello? Huh. Um, yeah, online is much harder, uh, definitely. But I think the concepts are the same. You need to get to know your students, not just think of mm -hmm. your books, for example, not just thinking of the English lesson. You need to know your students. What do they like? What do they not like? What sports do they play? What musical instruments do they play? First of all, you should get to know them and you need to build a personal relationship with all of your students. That's how you break down the barrier. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, with um, online and distance teaching, they're already there. You know, they don't want to participate. Uh, students have their cameras closed, microphones turned off, so it's really difficult to get to them. But if you get to know them on a more personal basis, uh, you can... Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I think we have a kind of a connection problem your your voice is coming and you know the going can you hear me clearly sarah hello sarah can you hear me clearly just i think can't hear just a moment i will invite her again just a moment I think there's a problem. <coughs> so sorry for this. Sometimes it happens like this connection problems. I'm waiting for her to join. We're still waiting for her. Let me invite her again. Yes. Uh, I'm waiting for Sarah to join. Sorry for this connection problem. Ha, huh. yes. Hello, Sarah, can you hear me? Hi, I'm back. Huh. Yeah, Hello, I, I think that was a problem, a connection problem. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Huh. Okay, now it's better. Sorry, sorry for this connection one stuff. Okay, 
So, yeah, you were talking about establishing the, uh, an effective report with the students, and but we just couldn't reach the last part. Is it possible to repeat the last part again? Of course. You... I was basically saying how um, we need to break down the wall between the teacher and the student because mm -hmm. teaching, unfortunately, there's a wall there. We can't touch the students. We can't, you know, see them physically. Uh, so to break that wall down, you need to get to know them and you need to build a personal relationship with the students. So, of course, it's much mm -hmm. for distance teaching, but this is something that you should put primarily. It shouldn't be the first, you know, you shouldn't be thinking first about teaching and getting the curriculum started. You should be thinking about getting to know your students, build that relationship. Because once you have that relationship in place, you can teach much easier and much more successfully. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And my, my, other, my other question is like, and uh, what strategies uh, would be effective, you know, to handle uh, mixed ability students in learning English as a foreign language? Uh, I always give the same answer for this. Definitely, we should all be using differentiated learning. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very popular, huh? One. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But where much luckier that we can implement the Dalton education model at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows us to teach differentially. We can put our students into smaller groups. We can allow independent teaching. Uh, we can allow uh, peer support. So the stronger students help the weaker students. They model, you know, they're doing uh, what teachers would be doing actually in a normal mm -hmm. classroom but it gives the students more confidence. The weaker students get support all the way around. First of all, they'll ask their friends for help. If they don't get the help, they yes. ask the teacher. Stronger teachers are teaching, which allows them to repeat and renew their knowledge. It gets them to speak more. In a traditional classroom, it's the teacher talking all the time. Students, maybe one or two sentences. <laughs> yes, you're right. With the Dalton education model and differentiated learning put together in terms of group work, we get much more active, much more confident, much more higher levels of English uh, coming out of the classrooms. I see. It's great, wonderful. I also, you know, really like to use differentiated education system. Like the the system, it's really wonderful one. It's really great. Is what we what the students need actually, especially in the classroom environment, to learn something. Okay, thanks. And my other my other question is like, you know, uh, does the learning process, you know, actually, you know, matter, or is it all about the uh, achievement of outcomes? What do you think? Hello. Did you hear the question, Sarah? 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 Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Sorry, can you hear me now? Can you repeat the, hi, can you repeat the question? Huh, okay, the, my, my question, my question was, does the learning process actually matter or is it all about the achievement of outcomes? Of course, yes, uh, Volcan, I see. Can you hear me now? Huh. Sorry, can you repeat the question? It cuts off just as you were asking the question. Uh, oh, no problem. I mean, I said, does the, you know, does the learning process actually matter or is it uh, all about the achievement uh, of outcomes? Mm -hmm. Definitely, the learning process matters. Actually, I think it's more important than the outcome most of the mm -hmm. time. I know in reality, our students have exams um, and most of them are working towards achieving well in these exams. But for English, I feel it's different. And I feel like it is the learning process that's much more important. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of, let's look at the Turkish education system. In the eighth yes. grade, they'll be asked 10 questions about English. That's it. But they started <laughs> to learn English from second grade. 
So I don't think that's a real judgment of students' English. And I also don't think that's enough, you know. Students will be yes. learning English for six years at least. And I don't think one exam can show, you know, their ability actually. And then when you think of the uh, university exam, English isn't even compulsory. Uh, so when you think no. of that way, English actually isn't even important then in high school, which is a complete mm -hmm. wrong idea. So I think definitely it's the learning process that's much more important in teaching English. You know, we I want to, our aim as English teachers is to see our students, you know, being left in a foreign country and being able to speak, being able to find their way, being able to order food, find a hotel, be a tourist. <laughs> this is what our aims are actually not just getting 10 full points on the Lege Se exam. So I think definitely I see, it's agree. the process, not just the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. With, I agree with you. You're right. It's just it's not the process and not the outcomes, as you said. Thanks, sir. And my other question is this. And how do you keep your, on, your online English students, you know, interested in what you are teaching or How do you, in other words, how do you motivate them to learn? It's really hard, you know, to mm -hmm. do it, especially in online environment. So what do you suggest to us? Um, keeping everything varied, but having the students know the plan, if this makes sense. So, for example, you know, you have 10 lessons of English a week, but there'll be different lessons, not just the same course book, not just the same teacher teaching the same thing. We need to have a variety of lessons and projects mm -hmm. as well. Um, for example, in our one weekly plan, you'll see there are, of course, main course lessons, traditional lessons, where you'll be teaching yes. uh, more maybe grammar-based topics. But then the next lesson, you'll see there's a whole class doing karaoke online. Or you'll see there's a whole class that's done a reading project from their online reading accounts. So it's about keeping things mixed up. And I also mm -hmm. think it's really important that you give the students a chance to speak. They're already kept apart from their friends for months now. Like you said, since March, students have been kept away from each other. They haven't so socialized. So I think it's good to allow them time to do this as well. And when it's in English, mm -hmm. it's a bonus for us. You know, they're using the language as well. Um, so keeping things varied, but let the students know what's going to happen. For example, are they going to be doing a quiz? Are they going to be um, doing some writing on Padlet, for example, one of the technology tools? Yes. Are they going to be singing a karaoke song? Are they going to be doing... They need to know what's happening, but mm -hmm. keeping it varied at the same time. And it gives students time to be themselves as well. They need to have fun. They need to feel relaxed and just speak sometimes. I think that's important. That's important. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. <laughs> And my, my, uh, can I move to other question? Of course, yeah. Okay. So what do you find uh, most frustrating and rewarding about teaching? Ooh. Okay, that's <laughs> It's a very question. hard one. <laughs> <laughs> frustrating. Yeah. Hard one. yeah. Uh, frustrating, I would say is sometimes the lack of communication and the lack of teamwork. And I don't mm -hmm. mean this between teachers, I mean this between like the triangle, which is the student, the teacher, and the parents. Uh, I see. And that could be sometimes the most frustrating thing. I definitely know, and you know as well, how hard teachers are working right now. Even normally, face-to-face yeah. -face lessons, you know, our job isn't, like I said, nine to five. It's already any unlimited hours, but especially now, uh, distance teaching. Um, mm -hmm. We're working even harder. We're trying even harder. But sometimes if that triangle isn't completed, if the student isn't involved, if the parent isn't involved, the teacher's kind of doing a one-way battle sometimes. And that can be the mm -hmm. most frustrating thing. And I've seen this a lot with our teachers at Dalton. I know how hard they're working, but sometimes they don't always have the support of the student and sometimes not the support of the parents and the family as well. So that's one of the most frustrating things at I times. See. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay, great. That's the frustrating one. 
Any rewarding <laughs> about teaching? <laughs> of course. Um, I think the rewards of teaching definitely outweigh the negatives in 100%. And I think that's all why we're still in this career. I Most see. of us have been teaching for many years now. And I know yes. that none of us are planning to give up. That means that there's obviously some rewards. And for me, um, it was always seeing uh, the confidence in students grow. So I was lucky that I've been able to teach, you know, kindergarten students. And they mm -hmm. started the school year just by looking at me, not even saying a word. And they finished mm -hmm. the year by speaking and they're trying to explain themselves. And this was always, you know, great to see. When you look yes. at primary school students, they learn to read and write with you. And I think that's something that's really amazing. You know, they come and they don't even know how to hold a pencil. And by the end of the year, they're writing you letters saying how much they love you and you're their favorite teacher. You know, <laughs> these good. kind of things, uh, you know, That's definitely good. rewarding. And I then see. when you go into middle school and high school, I think the best thing ever is when you just sit and you talk to your students. And, you know, they're speaking to you in English and they feel comfortable with you. They feel confident enough to speak English with you. And I think that's the best thing ever, just being able to sit and chat with your students. That's Great definitely one. The, one of the best rewards for me. And the rewards definitely outweigh the hard work and the frustrations, 100%. I see. Great. Thank you. Wonderful one. <laughs> Great one. Okay. And my, my other question, Sarah, is like, uh, who was the most... This is actually about your teaching experiences. Like, who was the most, you know, difficult student you have had? And how did you deal with, the pro with, with that student, with the problem? Don't give a name. Just you can give us an example. Okay? Okay. So, um, okay, we can call him David. We'll say David. You know, uh, okay, David. English name. Okay. Um, <laughs> David was a young boy that was making lots of problems in the classroom. Um, behavior problems, aggression, uh, sometimes violent, sometimes swearing. There wasn't a good classroom environment with David around. And of course that was kind of like a challenge for me. And I wanted to know what was mm -hmm. David's problem actually. And we realized that David was incredibly clever. And that was one of the biggest problems. He was bored in all of his lessons. This wasn't just about English, actually. Um, he was completely bored. He already knew everything. And um, when he got bored, he would just destroy the lesson. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we spoke with the parents and we agreed to move David up to a higher class. So he jumped. And once we got him into the higher class, we then started to work on his behavioral issues, his aggression, his violence. And I did that by just spending It was really, you know, again, I think we have a kind of the connection problem that that was talking about the, the, the very nice experience of her one of her students so yes so sorry for this let me invite her again to listen the story because that's, that's the really nice you know the situation that she was explaining hi sarah I okay, again, problem. It's okay, no problem. You know, we 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 was just you know the you know the the connection gone. You said we uh, moved him to high class, like up next mm -hmm. class, the next level of class. You said that, and after mm -hmm. that, we didn't hear it. Okay, so we moved David up to a higher class which he was more than capable of doing. He was ready 100%. And once we got him settled in the class, we started to work on his behavioral problems, his aggression, his violence. And the way I did that was by spending time with him, actually, by listening mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. um, 
it involved some mentoring it involved some coaching but more than anything it involved get it involved me getting to know him getting to know his real problems actually getting to know his dog's name his dog's favorite food <laughs> you know these kind of things he felt special and after that we really saw a massive improvement in his behavior and since then he's he's been good you know he was a success great. story mm -hmm. it's great it's great but again, the nice this was only possible through teamwork the parents were involved uh, all of the teachers got involved and got on board to support him it wasn't just a one teacher thing it was the whole you know the whole, whole team as, yes mm -hmm. as as just you mentioned about the triangle the students the, and the parents and the teachers that triangle they work together and this comes up and the teachers something like it's a great one great i really like the that that this the, the experience with the student and my other <clears throat> my other question is uh, this and what do you think about the future of language education the future of language education Lang okay um it's never going to be the <laughs> same again you know um, uh -huh. Things have changed, and maybe this was for the best. We've had to take a big leap into using technology, um, but there's no going back now. You know, we're going to have to adapt to more technology in the classroom. Like mm -hmm. I said, it's become clear that teachers are needed. No, the teachers are complaining, and the students are complaining. The teacher needs to be with the students. That's never going to change. That shouldn't change. I you know, see. the teacher mm -hmm. needs to be in the classroom. But I think we've all learned um, how we can teach in different ways, how we have to adapt to a changing generation, a change in time. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. using technology when it's needed and also leaving technology when it's needed as well. So in that way, our teaching is never going to be the same after this situation, you know, after the pandemic. Um, but some of these things we I can see. learn from, some of them will be good changes for us. That's for sure. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And my, my other question is about like, uh, do, you think, uh, do you think that the current way of teaching, uh, educating children fully pre prepares them uh, for the needs of 21st century? Um, no. <laughs> Did you hear? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you, you thought uh, no, but <laughs> it's a very nice and short answer. And definitely <laughs> answer. No. Great. Uh, definitely not. Any. I think especially the generations that are graduating now and the generations that we're teaching currently, they're not getting an education that's enough to you know prepare them for life. Actually, they're not prepared to go into the real world, to go to university, to go into jobs. And this is the reality, actually. We see mm -hmm. students that are coming with less responsibilities. Um, part of the problem is not just the school education, it's also the home education. You know, students yes. need to take responsibility from a young age. They need to be responsible for their own actions, for their own learning. But unfortunately, this kind of um, education model, when we look in general in Turkey, that education model doesn't support students becoming independent and responsible individuals. Um, so in reality, unfortunately I not. Like, mm -hmm. The education isn't enough, I would say. I see, okay, thank you. And it's, 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 it's really sad to hear this, but it's the reality, as you said. <laughs> yeah, this is the reality, unfortunately. Yes, um, I hope it will become better. In, in near future, I can say. <laughs> okay, so my other other question is, uh, what role do you think uh, the government should play in education? Hmm. Uh, that's a really good question, and I think it affects us all. I mean, both mm -hmm. of us are teachers in private schools, and I feel like we're a lot luckier to be teaching in private schools. Mm -hmm. We have many chances. Uh, many more opportunities um, but when I think in general government schools especially they need much more support um, mm -hmm. not just in terms of the curriculum they need more support in terms of how much is invested into teaching um, this can sometimes be the actual physical environment 
students need to have a place to learn where they feel safe, comfortable. They need to be able to have their own personal space. But they also need to be able to freely, you know, run around, let out their energy. Um, they should have the mm -hmm. chance to teach. A teacher should have the chance to teach in uh, natural environments. And students the same. You know, everything can't be taught within four walls. So, you know, this is something that the I government think. should really invest in more. In more 21st century skills, you know, creativity. Creativity yeah. can't happen between four walls, actually. So I think this is something that the yeah. government could be looking into more, you know, invest in. When I say invest, I don't just mean financially. I mean, also in terms of mm -hmm. time and research, you know, how students are learning now and how they need to learn. This is something that the government could maybe support all teachers and especially the Turkish curriculum more especially. I see. I see. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I saw a question over there. Mm -hmm. Let's look about it. Azra asks, and in thanks advance, how about students' assessment, multimodal learning styles? She asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I guess she's talking about more exams, you know, assessment-based I think so, yeah, here. assessment. So we still do it, actually. Uh, the curricula doesn't change as such. When you're doing differentiated teaching, uh, the topics, the projects, the aims are the same, actually. But um, more time to the students that need it. Uh, the weaker students get more support. Your middle level students get to have a bit more uh, comfort while they're learning. And the highest students get to repeat and relearn what they've taught. They, give it, they have a chance to model. So at the end of the day, if you do differentiated teaching fully, you can actually mm -hmm. assess a similar method as well. Maybe at the start, you can't be giving the same assessments. Uh, you'll have to, you know, like you change your lessons, you can change your exams at the same time, you know, when you're assessing the students. When I say assessing, for me, this doesn't mean the uh, Ministry of Education exams. You know, there's something different for me. They don't really show students full learning. But at the start, you can also do differentiated assessment. You need to know where your students have started from and mm -hmm. follow them, follow their progress. So it wouldn't be fair to give the lowest group, the highest group's exam. And it yes. wouldn't be fair for the highest group to get the lowest group's exam. You know, so you have to also, also do differentiated assessment. But when you see that you're being more successful, the gap between the levels starts to close. And that's when you know that you're doing differentiated learning successfully. The gap starts to close and all your students go up to a similar level. I see. Okay. I think that's a nice answer of the question i think uh, she got I, if she is still here i think she is i mean happy with your answer probably okay. yeah thank you a lot no, thank you very much <laughs> yeah thanks a lot for the answer sarah and, <clears throat> and my uh, another question is actually you know you know the time you know the flights really we are almost coming end of our live sessions I have just you know couple questions left, but before that, uh, I really wonder this one: uh, What is your motto? Hmm. My motto for teaching. Your teaching, or in as you know, for your life vision, or your teaching, whatever you want. Okay, uh, I th I think it's definitely that you can't just teach you can't just uh talk you can't just explain you have to give the students a chance to implement things for themselves um so there was a phrase that i used a few years ago actually when a student wants a fish you don't go and buy the fish you teach them how to fish and i think that's a motto that all teachers should be using actually give the students chance to learn for themselves but guide them and support them It's a great one. I really like this. I I remember you. You know, one of your one of your uh, seminars when I attended. Uh, you mentioned this one, and I really like that quote. Like when your students want a fish, don't give them a fish. Teach them how to 
catch a fish, something like this. Like this. I still remember exactly. it and you're still using this one. That was a really nice one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll keep it in my mind still. <laughs> All right, great. And my <clears throat> my other question is Sarah, is about uh what uh what does an educated person look like today for you? What does an education educated person look like? Yes, what does an educated person look like for you today? Um, you know, for me, when you say education, I think it's so broad now. We can't just say, you know, um, like I think when we were kids, for us, an educated person would look like a professor. You know, that's the idea that we <laughs> yeah. all had somebody clever, crazy hair, white, writing on a blackboard. But for now, I uh -huh. think education is such a wide topic that, you know, I think an education, educated person is anybody that is taking the time to read, that is taking the time to improve themselves, that's taking mm -hmm. the time to listen to others, take examples. Um, for me, an educated person is this, you know, I can't say an educated person should have an IQ of this much or an educated person <laughs> should finish this university because you know everyone has their own talents their own mm -hmm. interests but i think an educated person is someone who is continuing to learn no matter how old they are i see okay great thank you and my last question sir my last question is this it's about the students like how do we and how do we help students our students to discover their uh, passions or their potentials? Mm -hmm. um, you have to give them the chance. And most of the time, because we're so worried about the curriculum, finishing the unit on time or getting prepared for the exam, we don't give them the opportunities actually, which is why uh, project-based learning is so important for me as well. Because the students, mm -hmm. you'll see they choose a topic that they actually enjoy or a topic mm -hmm. that they know about and that they feel confident to talk about. So by giving choices to the students, not just saying, this is your assignment, this is your homework, this is the book you need to read. Instead of saying this, we need to give students choices. So of course we have a topic, we have a unit theme, the big idea or the big question. Mm -hmm. But you should give students choice. How do you want to do your project? What do you want your topic to be? Give them key words, of course, give them support, but let them find their own map. Let them find their own topics. Let them present how they want. Some students will be comfortable coming to the front of the class and talking, singing, dancing. Other students won't be. They'll want to do like a PowerPoint or a more closed presentation. Yes. You know, you mm -hmm. have to give them the choices. That's how they're going to improve their English. You know, mix in the English with what interests them. And that can I only see. happen to choice. I see. Thank you, Sarah. And yes, and we are we are almost coming to end. And so mm -hmm. before I before I you know the finish the live sessions, I would like I as I ask to all of my you know the guests, and I'm going to ask you again. What would you like to say? to our listeners, to our teachers or educators, or who will listen us later or watch this uh, session later as your last word? Um, so for teachers, definitely keep going. I know it's an incredibly hard time. Um, we're teaching in a way that we were never prepared for. No one told us how to be distance teachers. No one told mm -hmm. us about the long hours involved in online teaching. Nobody told mm -hmm. us about the never ending job, <laughs> but keep on going because I know that all teachers, you know, they always put their students first. And at the end of the day, what we're doing, is going to be appreciated. And maybe not mm -hmm. right now, but in a few months time, the students are going to say, wow, mm -hmm. you did this for me. You helped me. You didn't give up. So definitely don't give up. Don't lose your hope, even though it's a really difficult time for students and teachers. You know, keep on going and believe in what you're doing. <laughs> Great. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. And I would, I would like to say uh, thank you to, you know, to join my, our session, Teacher Talk sessions. And it 
really, you really made us happy tonight, and you really, you know, provided us lots of info information and and yes, lots of suggestions and very good ideas in your experiences. And thank you very much again for your time, for your experiences and ideas and suggestions. You know, the time flies quickly. I really didn't understand. And I was really, really, you know, really happy to see you here in this live session. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank <coughs> you, Volkan. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It really means a lot. Um, and I feel like, you know, as a group of teachers, because most of us are teachers, you know, listening to this. Yes. You no, know, we're there to support each other, to guide each other, to help each other. So anytime, you know, I'd be more than happy to uh, be a guest again for Creative English. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I hope we will do other things in the future if we have a chance or if we can do it. I will be really happy. And I would like to also thank you to our listeners and to join us tonight and don't, you know, the, leave us alone here and they came and they listened. And also I would like to say, you know, the thank you to the people who will listen us or watch us later. And that's all for tonight from Teacher Talk Sessions. And we had Sarah Louise Money uh, from Dalton College as an edu educational coordinator or from there. So thank you very much one more time. And I hope to see each other again. And good night, everybody. And good night, Sarah. And peace. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. You too.